Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Tio Yuyen. I'm one of the editors of Academia SG. Welcome to Academia SG's uh, Singapore Studies Junior Scholar Seminar Series. I'm happy to say that this is already the eighth presentation in our series. And over the last few months, we've had the opportunity to hear about some very exciting projects that our young scholars are working on. And audiences at these events have been wonderful in giving constructive and encouraging feedback that's useful to our presenters. So I'm sure today we will continue in this vein. We're pleased that today's seminar is organized in collaboration with the University of Victoria's Department of Political Science, as well as the Center for Asia Pacific Initiatives. Presenting her work today is Lin Ng. Lin is a PhD candidate in political science at the University of Victoria in Canada. Her presentation, which is titled Underrated Contributions of Elderly Care, Singapore and Taiwan, is a proposal for her PhD project. She will take about 30 minutes to share this. After she speaks, we will hear comments from Associate Professor Anju Paul from Sociology and Public Policy at Yale and US College in Singapore. Professor Andrew Paul is an international migration scholar with a research focus on migration to, from, and within Asia. Andrew has also been working on constructing a global care policy index, which will be quite relevant, I think, to today's topic. After Lynn and Anju speak, we will have about 20 minutes for Q&A with audience members. Please note that the session is being recorded. Um, to minimize distractions, we ask that you turn off your microphones and cameras while our speakers are speaking. Uh, maybe later on when we have a more informal discussion, you can turn them on. Uh, you may type your questions into the chat box, but I would like to ask that you hold off on doing this until we are at the Q&A section so as not to distract the speakers and other, other audience members during the presentation. So thank you again uh, for showing up this morning and I will turn it over to Lynn. Hi everyone, uh, it's, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to present here and uh, I'm really excited for the conversation as well and great. So I will just uh, share my screen and kind of introduce myself before I launch into the presentation. And here I go, give me a moment. Oops, uh, let me do that again. Right, are you able to view the yes. PowerPoint, right. the slide well, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, my presentation is titled Underrated Contributions of Elderly Care. It's a comparison between Singapore and Taiwan. And uh, this presentation is actually based off my research proposal for my PhD, which I defended a few months ago. And so I'm really using this presentation as a sounding board or kind of like a base for more inspiration and ideas. Uh, I've just gotten back to Singapore for my field work and I hope to travel to Taiwan in the hopes that a travel bubble opens up. And actually I was supposed to compare Singapore and Hong Kong, but due to, uh, since the protests erupted and all that, we kind of thought it was a better idea to perhaps change the location of field work as well. So um, my research questions for this proposal, which I think will change along the road, uh, are the three of these. So um, I start off by asking, how do the Singapore and Taiwanese states manage the available support systems for elder care? And then how can we understand the social expectations and allocation of care work responsibilities? And finally, does the care setting, i.e. the home community and institutions, have any impact on the lived experiences of elder care workers in Singapore and Taiwan? And I think this third question feels a little bit more shaky because with COVID, it seems like uh, interviewing healthcare workers in nursing homes is becoming more and more unfeasible. And I think I do have, uh, I, I am holding out here in terms of hoping that the restriction ease and all that. But even then, I think nursing homes are still a hotspot and getting in as a visitor with 
no one I know staying in there uh, will be challenging. And I think on the whole, as my field work develops as well, I'm not sure if all of the research questions here might see some revisions here and there. And I expect they will too. And at this stage, I'm just kind of confused in a good way, I guess. So for this literature review that I'm using for my project, um, I use kind of three frameworks to kind of inspire or move my research along. And I don't intend this to be a, just a simple theoretical application, but uh, more like a, just an intellectual resource to interpret my interview findings. And so the first one I use is the developmental state concept, including global care chains, which is the developmental state concept is a very classic model used to describe the East Asian developmental stage, uh, state, which Singapore fits into, at least conceptually, based off the model of Japan. And the global care chains basically describes this framework used to analyze how care as a commodity kind of flows from the quote unquote uh, less developed regions of the world to more industrialized regions of the world. And then uh, the second and third frameworks are frameworks that I think are closer to my heart in terms of uh, using social identity for analysis. And feminist political economy and racial capitalism, I think are basically what is driving the project and the concerns at this moment. So why is this relevant in terms of uh, my project to wider society and of course to the, to the audience here? Um, I think the key intellectual resources of course is feminist political economy and racial capitalism. And basically, I think when I combine these two frameworks together, what I see is so-called uh, the subsumption of gender and race identity into the schema of wage work because the, the theoretical framework of racial capitalism and FPE basically looks at the history of England itself and events like the Bacon's Rebellion in the US to kind of look at how wage work under a capitalist system was something that really subsumed or swallowed the idea of gender and race identity in terms of capitalist bosses using human differences um, that were pre-existing to kind of exacerbate divides between workers in a way that really broke down the potential for solidarity. So I think a lot of people who are thinking about race in Southeast Asia do recognize that and they kind of are struggling to kind of narrate to their friends around them or the local audience there about how maybe we can think about gender and race as beyond um, actual human differences, but really something that is so subsumed into our everyday life of paid work, so taken for granted. And I think the prominent scholars that I've consulted are Mariami, Silva Federici, Satnam Verdi, and Jodi Melamed, uh, uh, among a few others. And in the local context, in terms of Singapore and Taiwan, I'm thinking of a lot of prominent geographers and scholars here as well, uh, including uh, Prof. Tio Yu Yan here as well, uh, who is, uh, I read a lot about the article she published on uh, the comparisons between uh, unpaid caregivers here in Singapore and domestic workers, among many others, of course. And I'm thinking of also uh, Prof. Brenda Yu and Shalina Huang at NUS Geography. And in Taiwan, I'm thinking of Pei Chia Lan and Shu Ju Eda Cheng, who have both published very extensively uh, on their local research in terms of their findings with interview, findings and interviews with domestic workers. So I think all of these resources are things that I have been consulting and will continue to consult. So in terms of the relevance and the implications of um, my project for public awareness, I feel that uh, at least optimistically, what I think I can contribute is so-called uh, towards the public awareness of gender and race in paid work. And I feel that this can influence the attitudes of elderly care because elderly, elderly care is really an industry that fits uh, squarely into what the local parlance would call 3D, dirty, dangerous and difficult. And this attitude itself is something that is uh, a huge obstacle when it comes to reforming the rights of many domestic workers whose duties involve elder care and even the formal healthcare workers who are in nursing homes and hospitals. And the wider implications here I see are the gaps in knowledge would be actually not so much in the academic literature because I do feel that in the scholarship, especially the recent few decades, there has been a lot of attention paid to the role of the Japanese empire and, and race and the British colonization in influencing these attitudes. But 
really it's more in the local parlance and the local awareness that um, kind of immediately looks at gender as uh, actual differences between men and women and then race as just about skin color or some attitude of um, ethnicity or kind of cultural difference that seems to be automatically attached to race. And I don't think anyone would disagree that some of these differences might might really influence how we live our lives and our attitudes toward work. But I think it's uh, not just me, of course, but many other scholars out there would be kind of keen on looking at paid work itself as a, as a way to kind of think through gender and race. And elderly care has come up as something that is uh, extra relevant, especially in this COVID world. So an example that I have so far is uh, my informants that I've managed to speak to, some of the domestic workers. Uh, a lot of them actually narrate anti-capitalist strategies of approaching care work. And I think I would get to elaborate more on that later. And I think uh, there are many popular stereotypes based on nation nationality that are found online as well. When you Google online, there's a lot of um, platforms and all that uh, talking about how you might quote unquote manage your domestic worker better. And it's those attitudes that uh, many people would feel are problematic as well. And in terms of the field work, um, these are some of the pictures that uh, you will see or some scenes you will see when you go out on a Sunday. And of course, now it's not the case since phase two heightened alert has come in, but here and there you do see some of them. And I have managed to speak to about seven FDW foreign domestic worker informants so far through video call as they were more comfortable with that. And I would share a little bit about that uh, later on. And I do apologize that this is something new that I've added just about a day or two ago because it didn't come up until, until, until then. And um, I just like to take the chance to kind of uh, hope that my research would kind of contribute to local attitudes toward elderly care and domestic work and kind of garner more respect for the FDW community. So um, I take a grounded approach to the analysis of interviews, which is part of my methodological approach as well. And my first few interviews were done online. And I kind of use these two central questions as a driving, driving line of inquiry in terms of what does elder care mean to you? And if I were to write our conversation to my thesis, is there anything you would like to express? So um, a lot of them actually took on a protagonist kind of posi positionality in that I found that um, Many of them had some idea about my identity as a student researcher. So one or two of them asked me directly, like, what do you need? Or is there anything you would like me to, what kind of questions do you want me to answer? But after I kind of um, listed my talking points or kind of identified that, oh, I'm interested about what you think about elder care, those kinds of things, they kind of just straight away went into their own storytelling kind of narrative approach. And I realized that, to a lot of them, I think uh, what seemed like an interview to me might have been some much needed social interaction on their end. A lot of them have not been taken off days since COVID or not, uh, not many at all. And I realized that I think apart from their friends or so, um, they saw my online presence as perhaps just a, a good opportunity to just talk to someone, even if digitally. And in that sense, some of them, uh, they kind of went off track, quote unquote, but I think it's it's all very valuable information because uh, they all touch on what does elder care mean to them in their own way. Most of them did this by sharing just how difficult it was to perform this task, which they felt was not very appreciated by many of their employers. So a lot of them really shared, oh, Amma or Akong did this or that and how difficult it was to cope, especially when they were living alone. And, but overall, I found that um, there were moments where our identities uh, contributed to their willingness to elaborate. Um, maybe they saw me as a, as a younger person and they kind of felt that um, I wasn't a, they were aware that perhaps I wasn't a senior faculty or I didn't look like an extremely seasoned interviewer out there, so to speak. And they kind of saw me as a, like a student researcher because I, I did identify myself as a student researcher. So the way they spoke to me perhaps was influenced by, by that as well, the, the age dynamic. And I found that um, some observations thus far is that of course, the difficulty of elderly care 
cannot be underestimated. A lot of them were just sharing about how um, their employers often treat the elderly care duty as a very casual side job that uh, they feel that anyone can do. But the emotional labor that they have to shoulder, especially when the clients behave badly, uh, oftentimes racist, especially those with dementia, that's something that is so, so difficult to, to handle by themselves. And a lot of them feel that not enough community resources exist for them to emotionally vent their, their, their stresses unlike the channels that are available for, for local care caregivers. And of course, the second so-called theme that I found is basically the, uh, their job scope is really boundless and it's just labeled as a, as a domestic, but it really ranges from everything to education. A lot of them actually teach the children at home English spelling, help them with their homework, um, other than the everyday chores of cooking, cleaning, washing, and then caregiving also for children and elderly. So it's really a boundless job scope that I think is hard to do justice to. Um, they, they also feel that uh, it's the word made, which is used in local parlance, is uh, very derogatory compared to the skill levels that they actually possess. And some of them actually have a lot of medical knowledge in terms of tube feeding for the elderly, how to test their blood oxygen levels, those kinds of things, which are basically things that nurses in the hospitals have to instruct them before they can be discharged. So all of that is being informalized. And of course, um, one thing that came up also was the feelings of sadness at the local care situation. Um, a lot of them describe how from their perspective, they felt that uh, there is some abandonment and neglect. And I do want to clarify that this is not for all of those that are interviewed, but for many of them, actually. I think it's about four to five out of the seven or eight that I spoke to. Um, some of them have had, a lot of them have had more than one employer, but they have had both positive and negative experiences. So for many of them, they experience this side of the local care situation in terms of uh, feeling that, that adult children themselves are kind of abandoning the elderly client or kind of neglecting them. They kind of, uh, they feel that as long as they pay the domestic worker, they can totally offshore the entire task, both physical and emotional to the domestic worker. And a lot of elderly clients, they feel actually, they themselves are lonely, which is contributing to the bad behavior in the first place. And most of them don't actually get their emotional needs met by uh, their family members. And a lot of the domestic workers were narrating about how they felt that their culture of origin, uh, especially from the Philippines, they, they cite how their culture would kind of valorize the elderly in a way that um, sees this situation as very unjust. And uh, I don't want to generalize, but I'm basing this based on the the seven that I've spoke to so far, but I believe I will get a lot more perspectives along the way as my field work unfolds. Ho hopefully the situation will get better and I can you know, go out there and talk to more people. And another theme of course was, um, this may be based on my own inference and some of my own writing projects thus far, but really it was just the sheer amount of resi resilience that uh, they had towards the this situation of theirs in terms of, um, Many of them have had to cope with bad or abusive treatment. Uh, none of them I've spoken to were currently in such uh, cases, but some of them have had experiences of complaining to the Ministry of Manpower or reaching out to NGOs to ask for help because some of their previous employers have been abusive ones who did not extend off days. Uh, luckily, luckily, they had access to a, to a cell phone and that really helped with um, reaching out to very prominent local activists like Jonathan Huang who helped them really engage with uh, Ministry of Manpower. So some of these migrant acts uh, are observable and some of them are not so observable in terms of being at home. So some of them really cope with the bad behavior by their clients by maybe extending their home family ties. So very common is like, oh, I would care for Amma the same way I would care for my own parents or my own grandparents. And they kind of extend it failure piety into their current employment situation. Although they feel that it's not directly transferable, but it's really a, at least a useful coping strategy. And then when they manage to go out with their friends or chat with their friends, 
they complain about it or they just vent, you know, to, to, to one another face, face to face. Um, many of the informants I spoke to, they know one another as well. And they were kind of telling me about, oh, I, this other person who I'm sure you've spoken to, she does this and that. So that is um, something I think is also a kind of like, strategy of resistance against this uh, against the local employers and of course many of them have good family relationships and they are treated uh, well as well but this is also something that I've come to observe maybe um, in, a, in a separate circle where their employers are not present and of course in tri FTW differences for example nationality is a potent source of tension and um, a lot of them especially uh, ones of a certain nationality. Um, it has come up that I think uh, the Filipino advantage has come up quite prominently in terms of many of them not necessarily believing that Filipinos are inherently better, but citing this idea of uh, their government at least doing a bit more or them having a stronger rights awareness compared to other counterparts of other nationalities like Indonesians or Myanmar who perhaps a bit more disadvantaged in this area. And in terms of the way they speak about one another, um, I think I would like to explore more about that or kind of talk to more people about that before I come to any conclusions. So my interviews thus far have really just uh, stopped, come at, uh, at the preliminary stage and I've really just begun this. So I think the, the basis of this is really still kind of like a proposal kind of uh, like presentation and I kind of want to make sense of what I have so far based on that and also based on uh, the audience who are who are here so why Singapore and Taiwan of course uh, they have very shared developmentalist histories and both of them can be classified as so-called East Asian developmental states but I think more pertinent to my project here is really about ideologies of work and the worker especially in the guest worker regime and I want to kind of see if there are any historical continuities despite the radically different colonial experiences and modern state making history. So um, the Japanese empire was very profound for both of these countries, but I think Singapore was definitely more influenced by British colonization, a bit like Hong Kong, whereas Taiwan is, uh, has a more complicated mix of um, Chinese and Japanese rule. And I think the institutional legacies for that in regards to elderly care welfare is very prominent still. And there are historical continuities between uh, colonial race and gender ideologies to work and the worker in terms of the wage work scheme in both Singapore and Taiwan. So right now I'm still in Singapore, of course, and I do hope I can get to travel to Taiwan for that. And of course, in terms of this, I feel that uh, there are some concerns on my end in terms of the research tra trajectory, but I hope I've kind of elaborated on the, the justification for the comparison, but I'm happy to talk a bit more about this uh, later on. So um, both are very highly established city-states that I have some connections with, and I think I would still be keen on uh, making the most of my fewer opportunities. So I've opted to stay in Asia for about a year before I head back to Victoria so that I can at least hang, hang out onto the hope of uh, traveling here and there. So um, these are just some new sources that are relevant towards uh, some of the differences between Singapore and Taiwan's elderly care schema. So for the foreign domestic workers, Taiwan has a more um, explicit categorization of uh, whether a domestic worker is hired for chores or for elderly care. And this is not something that, um, this is not a detail that I want to uh, spend too much time here on, but I think it's just, something I want to identify as a potential point of comparison in terms of how useful are these um, divisions because I a lot of scholarly research has also shown that uh, of course it does make a fundamental difference but many people also use informal loopholes to kind of exploit domestic workers for elderly care as well especially when they should be on the other visa so some of these things are at stake uh, but of course for Singapore it's really just a domestic there's no um, recently there has been some uh, categorizations of that, but Taiwan has a more explicit division between uh, domestic and, and elderly care work within the home, at least. They have a much longer history of doing this than, than Singapore has. And I think um, the concerns and worries, of course, um, is that number one is that will I just end up just recycling the theories about 
what about the justice to my informants? So I, I am trying to do a grounded analysis in terms of interpreting my interviews transcripts as they are using the words that they do and not thinking about the theory first. But there is, of course, the concern that what if I just end up, you know, using racial capital in a way that perhaps, uh, in a way that perhaps does not do justice to the people that I'm speaking to. And of course, um, not being able to travel to Taiwan, which is a, would be a compromised research experience. And I do plan to, the emergency plan, of course, to go online and look at archives if, if the local public health restrictions really do not allow me to do that. And I think if it really does happen this way, I would be able to see it in a, in a more optimistic light, I guess. But that is, of course, still a concern because I think I will be able to speak to some people here. And I feel that if I don't get, get to do the same in Taiwan, it would be a bit unbalanced in terms of what do I do then? And of course, um, how feasible are these ideas and whether they, they are making sense to the audience here. Um, my proposal defense, I think, went well and I was uh, we were all quite happy with it. But I also just want to check if these, um, if the audience here has any kind of um, suggestions or comments or just very, uh, feel free to be like very blunt and honest about it in terms of whether you feel that this this actually is doable and what, what do you think about it? And anything else uh, about the project that I may want to factor in, I, I would want to want to factor in as well. So um, I want to reiterate again that I'm quite a, at an early stage and it's very open to being banded here and there. So my research is not like a solidified thesis or anything like that yet. It's really just, it's, it's all out there and I have paragraphs scattered all all around based on what I have so far, but I'm not at the stage of intensive writing. So it's it's really at the stage where I think usually people's research um, does shift here and there depending on what you actually get and who you actually meet and what who you actually end up talking to and those kinds of things. And of course, I'd like to say um, thank you to all of you for uh, giving me the opportunity to be here and to share my views here as well. And I do apologize for the tech. I think I did try to share a portion, but I actually have no idea whether that turned out well. So if you were seeing my notes down there, then uh, I do apologize for that. And um, I do want to say thank you again, uh, especially to Andrew who agreed to be my respondent and to all of you who um, have the good grace to host me in this platform. Thank you, Lynn. And now I will uh, turn things over to Anju. Anju, over to you. Thanks so much, Yu Yen. And thanks so much, Lynn, for your uh, really interesting and um, important presentation. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the final product uh, in, a, in a couple of years time. Um, so I'm gonna uh, give a brief um, summary of, of how I understand your um, project's focus to be, and then um, outline five comments slash questions that I have partly based on your presentation um, this morning and also the, the, the proposal paper that you shared, that you kindly shared with me. And so some of the things might not be familiar to the audience members, but um, um, will hopefully be familiar to Lynn. Um, so, um, as I understand it, the focus of this proposed dissertation is on the lived experience of elder care workers in Singapore and Taiwan and how this lived experience manifests um, the ways in which the modern sovereign state is a colonial product. Um, uh, and so linking how the domestic economy that was organized in colonial times has this, as you said, this historical continuity and how it's managed in the present day through a racial capitalist logic. Um, and, and the key goal here is to understand how it operates and manifests itself in two different locations and in the specific context of migrant elder care workers. So the, the underlying assumption um, of this work is that the devaluation of elder care has led to this reliance on cheap migrant labor to fill gaps, labor gaps in the sector, and that this has implications both on the quality of elder care being provided, but also on the living and working conditions of the elder care workers themselves. 
um, that the state's focus on reducing the cost of elder care, this constant focus on efficiency and cost minimization has led to this very precarious working um, conditions for the workers, which then also translates potentially into um, uh, 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 compromised quality of elder care. Um, so there's almost two different foci here, the, the, the lack of importance that's given to elder care within these two societies, and then the treatment of the workers themselves. And that's a really ambitious project. And I, I commend Lynn for taking on something that is um, so topical and, and, and just is going to remain urgent, I think, for many, many years to come. So I have about, as I said, about five comments slash questions. Um, and, and Lynn, really just think of them as, as, as food for thought. And you can choose to uh, not respond, not uh, directly um, answer any of these questions, but, but just kind of think about them in the background as you, as you continue with your field work. So the first point that I, I, I would make um, is a suggestion to provide a little bit more historical grounding um, um, to help the reader understand uh, how these migrant labor programs came to be and how they were set up in these two different countries. Um, and I think it's interesting that Hong Kong was your initial alternative site and Taiwan is sort of a, a substitute, a late, a late substitute. Um, but whatever the case, I think it's worth un, um, understanding for yourself and then understand, helping the reader understand that these migrant labor programs for care work um, in both countries were initially not set up for the purposes of elder care. Um, Singapore started its, its foreign domestic helper program in 1978. Taiwan, as I understand it, was in 1991. Um, and in, in both cases, the, the, the primary uh, care work responsibilities that the, the, these programs were meant to address was childcare, not elder care. Um, and, and part of that had to do with where these societies were at that period in time. In the 1970s, Singapore's percentage of, of Singapore residents who were age 65 and older was less than 5%, likewise in Taiwan. And so the challenges of what it meant to be an aging society was just not on the minds of most policymakers and even family members at that point. And there wasn't this big industry, this burgeoning industry that we see now focusing on elder care. So what does that mean when these guest worker regimes were set up for one purpose um, that had predated the rapid aging of these societies? And then what does it mean when they are being shifted more and more to focus on a, a slightly different population? Um, how does that mean, uh, what are the impacts of that and how domestic labor is being constructed within the industry? How are these workers being viewed by employers? Um, and also how do workers themselves see this, this, this change in emphasis? Um, it's, it's, I think, important to kind of disaggregate racial capitalism and racial capitalist models to think about whether or not they look the same when it comes to childcare versus domestic household responsibilities versus elder care. Are there differences rather than kind of treating this logic as the monolith? So that's one point to, I, I think, to just keep in mind. Um, related to that is the relative status of elder care versus child care. And I think that really does need to be unpacked. You've already hinted in, in your paper as well as in your presentation today that elder care is, is um, at least in the minds of your respondents, viewed as less, um, uh, less worthy, less valorized, less respected. And I found that really interesting how you framed child rearing and child care as more respected because it links to the, the kind of the, the development of future generations of a society of future citizens. And therefore that's seen as a, a more valorized type of care work as compared to elder work. Um, I'd, I'd actually suggest that you, you dig into that a little bit more and investigate that assumption a little bit more. That's certainly one view of childcare, mm -hmm. um, uh, but there are also, even within childcare, there are layers of care work that's involved. And you often find that mothers tend to monopolize the higher status childcare uh, work, leaving the lowest status childcare responsibilities to their migrant domestic workers. Pechia Lan's work in Global Cinderella's really helps talk about how childcare work is disaggregated and it's always the much, much lower status childcare work that's given to migrant um, domestic workers. On the other hand, elder care, especially um, in, in recent years, is something that the state in particular has recognized 
is at least semi-skilled, that involves, and you mentioned this yourself, some amount of medical training, um, certain specialized types of, um, of, of training for someone to be able to provide elder care. And so how childcare vis-a-vis elder care is constructed in the minds of both the domestic workers, but also the broader apparatus of this migrant labor system, I think is something that's really worth exploring um, as these societies shift more and more into uh, silver societies. Um, so I know that's not really a main focus of your work, but if there, there, if there are these kind of blurred boundaries in terms of, of, of care work, it's worth exploring how that fits within this racial capitalist logic. Um, the third point that I'd make has to do with how the elder care sector in Taiwan and Singapore is organized. Um, and I, and I, I recognize here that some of this planned work that you, that, you, uh, that you had hoped to do might not happen because of COVID, um, which I think would be really unfortunate because I think there's so much um, uh, potential to, to explore here. Um, the, in, in both Singapore and Taiwan, as in many other advanced countries, there's a clear hierarchy of jobs within the nursing sector. So nursing that's provided in home or sort of like assisted living um, um, is, very diff is seen as very different as compared to nursing in a nursing home facility. Um, so generally home care work is considered much more lower status, it's the least well paid. And so even within elder care, the hierarchies that exist, I think is something that's worth exploring. Um, this kind of within industry analysis of how racial capitalism works, I think could be really useful. And in this regard, Mega Amrit's work on caring for strangers does a wonderful job at explaining some of these hierarchies and structures within the nursing sector. Um, and she looked at um, Filipino nurses in Singapore, but she also talked about how Filipino nurses actively engage in boundary work to distinguish themselves from Filipino domestic workers um, because they did not want to be confused with the domestic worker. And so they talk, she talks about how they'd avoid going to Lucky Plaza on Sundays, they'd dress differently, they'd have different social groups because they, the, the, this presumption in Singapore, which you're well aware of, that if you're a Filipino woman, the default assumption is that you must be a domestic worker. And so they actively engaged in boundary work to ensure that the racial logics that are entrenched in Singapore society did not automatically apply to them. And so it'd be really interesting to see how elder care um, in an institutionalized setting versus a home setting is viewed by the workers themselves. This requires that access to nursing homes, which as you pointed out, might not happen. But I think there's, a um, again, trying to understand how these logics are internalized by workers and the, the strategies that they use to ensure that they are able to view themselves as worthy subjects, I think is something that um, has a lot of potential for, for research. Um, I, the, the, the final two points that I'll, I'll make, and these are quite uh, brief, is um, I do think a little bit more attention uh, needs to be placed on why Singapore and why Taiwan, and you, you've, you've already ex explained a little bit about the, the, this question about what are the historical continuities despite the differences in colonial experiences. I think it would be helpful to give a little bit more of a sense of what you're expecting to see in terms of different outcomes in these two different study sites. Um, and then finally, I think a little bit more, most of your focus is on the workers themselves. That, that's, that seems to be the primary focus of your interviews. But I think um, to truly understand the mechanisms and structures of racial capitalism, you do need to be um, studying other actors as well to understand how these logics get perpetuated in systems. And that requires not just studying the state and state policy um, and not just studying the workers themselves, but everybody in the middle. So the managers of institutions, the employers themselves, really understanding how they are um, working to undercut, to perpetuate, to maintain, to solidify these structures, I think is something that would help round out your field work. And so um, uh, trying to get more access to those individuals and actors, I think would also really help um, just uh, fill out some of the, some of the, 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 the stories that you're, you're, um, you're trying to capture. So I'm gonna stop there. I went a little bit over, I apologize, um, uh, but uh, back to you, Yuyen. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Andrew Paul, for those really thanks for like um, you know reading and um, unpacking so carefully and thoughtfully Lynn's uh, proposal. Um, and I thought those were really very constructive um, questions and suggestions. Before I open it up to um, Q and A, I, I just want to see very quickly if Lynn wants to say anything quickly in response to Andrew's comments. Oh, uh, yeah, but I'd just like to say thank you very much as well. Those uh, were very extensive and extremely helpful comments. And I do uh, intend to kind of um, interview others as well. Although uh, I think I'm facing a bit of a struggle because I expect that I will speak to quite a number of people. And sometimes you feel like, oh, I really want to foreground the voices of foreign domestic workers because they seem to be the most, uh, the ones who are most, uh, urgently need to get their views known and when I interview domestic em employers I expect that there will be a lot of contradictory narratives so I've just spoken to one the other day on a very informal basis and I already can tell that there are some views of work that are just uh, not the same so I, I think uh, I definitely would take that into consideration and I do want to speak to people in NGOs as well and uh, managers of placement agencies to kind of get a sense of you know how how things are, are better and I kind of am a bit intimidated thinking that there's still Taiwan but I, I believe I will I will get through it eventually and um, taking it in an optimistic note. And I, def I also really appreciate the suggestions on um, placing more attention towards the, the comparative aspect in terms of um, the so-called uh, what I expect to see different and what's the broad similarity and what's the differences. And I believe that will come up uh, more clearly along the way. Uh, right now, I only have a theoretical idea, but not yet a, a empirical sense of um, what differences there are and of course I will kind of factor in the other uh, suggestions about disaggregating how race works depending on the kind of care work and I'm also very keen on actually exploring the tension between childcare and elder care although in my proposal it's brief but I do believe that uh, depending on my informant network and what I actually speak uh, who I actually speak to I think there's actually a potential for maybe a kind of like a research question or maybe a significant portion around that because it definitely comes up for every informant that I speak to because once someone speaks about how she care for elderly, she will definitely also speak about indirectly. They will say, oh, it's different to caring for children or it's the same in what way is more difficult, is it easier and those kinds of things. So I, I do believe there is really also a lot of potential for that. And I'll be thinking about that as I move forward. Um, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I see that there are questions in the chat box, so I'm going to go ahead and read them. I think these are actually two related questions from Chong Kiet So. The first is, why is elderly care in these two societies, quote, racialized? And how does the colonial experience of these two societies affect elderly care? Relatedly, what is, quote, racialized capitalism? And why and how is it relevant to your proposed thesis? Lynn, would you like to address those questions? Yeah, uh, I would address them in the the to the best of my ability here. And uh, so, as to the first one, why is elderly care in Singapore and Taiwan racialized, and how does the colonial experience of these two societies affect elderly care? I think this question relates a little bit to Andrew's prior suggestion about pushing me to think about uh, what are the possible differences in outcomes that I'm expecting. And my hypothesis at this stage is that both Singapore and Taiwan have inherited to a certain extent the, the colonial regimes of race and gender in paid work, depending on who the actors were. And I see the Japanese empire as more fundamental for Taiwan than Singapore, but they were, of course, both very... Uh, influential for the Asian region as a whole. So I think for both Singapore and Taiwan, um, we have our own unique uh, so-called uh, population census, which applies to the domestic population. In Singapore, it would be the CMIO, Chinese, Malay, Indian, other schema used by the government. And that also has a very colonial history. And in Taiwan, I think it's a bit more uh, between the, the Han Chinese or Taiwanese Chinese and then 
they have an Aboriginal population as well, uh, a minority population. And that kind of racialized schema is also very influenced by the previous Japanese rule and then Chinese nationalist rule. So both of these so-called domestic racial schemas have uh, racialized uh, the elderly care in terms of uh, both the domestic caregiver workforce and also their decision to adopt guest worker regimes Taiwan a lot later than, than Singapore. But I do see uh, the connections in terms of how the guest worker regime for elderly care was um, so-called channeled into these racialized channels where usually it tends to be women of a certain of certain nationalities who take on those work. And even in the local population, it's also the usually the Aboriginal workers in Taiwan are more likely to end up in, in that sector. And in Singapore as well, um, there is a lot of racialization towards non-Chinese races. And I think the colonial experience of these two societies affect elderly care. My guess at this stage is actually uh, I haven't done this at length yet in my proposal or in my thesis, I think, but I do expect there to be some differences in the attitudes of filial piety because uh, the colonial experience of these two societies, I do feel that Singapore's experience was actually a lot more, a lot more British in the sense that uh, a lot more westernized in terms of inheriting the free market system directly. And the way that Confucian values was used by uh, the late Lee Kuan Yew or our, the PAP was, I think, more practically than so-called a real familiarity with that, with that cultural custom. Whereas I think in Taiwan, uh, they really look at filial piety in a more so-called traditional sense, as in they, they know the Confucian classics and they know the, what it means to be to care for the elderly, at least in, in a way that is more familiar towards uh, the idea of Chinese ancestry. And I think um, the way I phrase that perhaps is a bit, uh, it's very tricky to phrase it in a, in a, in a proper manner. But I, I, do, I do expect that the difference in colonial experience would have some, dif some effects on how the local governments have used the, the Confucian Federal Party to to justify their elderly care decisions. And in terms of racialized capitalism, uh, I would say this is quite a complex uh, theoretical framework to explain, but I think my main takeaway from this is basically scholars in this school would argue that uh, we need to think about um, race as not skin color, so to speak, but really more about uh, what the industrial wage economy did to the people in England first, and of course, when they colonize other people. And I think when I'm using this framework here, I'm really more interested in looking at how um, paid work itself is a, is a, is a logic that already uh, subsumes these identities. And I think I'm a bit wary of, there's just so much in terms of like the history of Europe, but my focus is on really Singapore and Taiwan. So I think how I, how I explain that to my local context is a, is a very tricky affair because usually you, you already spend so much talking about the history of Europe and how this happened and that and the fact that you know in, in England racialized doesn't mean didn't mean skin color at first it meant someone without property without employment and all of that just kind of um was so-called imported to the rest of the world but how do you explain that to a to a Southeast Asian society who itself is also reacting towards a uh, the arrogance of Western imperialism, so to speak. So I think um, racialized capitalism, my main takeaway now is really more about how it's relevant to the people in Singapore and Taiwan in terms of thinking more about the guest worker regime with that history of Europe in mind and how that might change things for uh, the entrance of foreign workers and even the local, local residents and citizens who are themselves subject to the, the national state of apparatus, people who are not so-called majority populations or the privileged populations in their own so societies. And yeah, so that's my very uh, answer. That's my answer to this at this stage. And I hope it's uh, satisfactory. Okay, just just uh, just to quickly comment on on your answer, I I sort of I want to suggest that you know you think about how to build that into your methodology moving forward on two fronts, right? One is thinking more systematically about when you compare Singapore and Taiwan, 
what are the things you could say about how race works in, in each of those cases and, and use that as a way to make a case for why these two cases, right? Like really kind of leveraging on the similarities and differences in thinking about what kinds of race regimes they are. But secondly, also to think about um, you know, since you've said that you're really interested in lived experiences, really thinking through what do you expect to find when you actually talk to people about how race works in everyday lives, right? And so on one level, what is the racialized regime? But on, on the second level, how does race work in everyday life? And again, use that as a way of thinking about what do you hope to get out of doing these interviews? What do the interviews, what will the interviews um, do in terms of helping you understand better, right, how race works or how gender works in, in these two cases. Um, I see that there are a couple of other um, comments and questions, so I'm going to read them in order, I guess. Uh, from Victor Chuang, thanks, Lynn, for your wonderful proposal. I think this is more common than a question, but I wonder if you would consider thinking about in your work, in addition to gender and race, also class and disability. For example, how does class affect the kinds of care one affords? And how does disability affect the kinds of care one is embedded within? Or even to consider using the case of the foreign domestic worker that you highlighted, how does global circuits of care embedded uh, FDWs within ideas of class disability debility? From Elizabeth Chan, thanks for your presentation, Lynn. Uh, more speculative question, where do you hope to see your project eventually contributing to in terms of both or either academic and non-academic contexts and fields? And then finally, uh, from Shannon Ang, and you made some very important points about stratification, even within the care work industry between foreign domestic workers and formal care workers like nurses. There are also cases where foreign domestic workers do not expect to look after older adults when they first arrive, but end up doing so after someone in the family has an incident. I wonder in your initial interviews, do you hear narratives of inadequacy and or comparison with formal care and how does that play or uh, interact with their understanding of race and gender? So um, I, I suppose three sets of questions. One is around, you know, thinking about disability and class and how that comes into your project. Second, what do you hope to contribute both to academic and non-academic fields? And then third, about stratification within the industry. Uh, your choice up to you, how you want to take the questions. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone for the wonderful questions and suggestions. I, uh, I would want to go through them uh, briefly in, uh, keeping note of the time. And um, so for, for Victor's question, uh, definitely I am considering that. And unfortunately, I don't think that will be the, the focus of my thesis, but I am actually considering speaking to unpaid caregivers locally as well. And because uh, there are a lot of comparisons as well in terms of um, having to hire a domestic worker or choosing to do that work yourself. There's many trade-offs, especially for uh, women who have lower incomes or women who are single single mothers or lower income households in general. So class definitely does affect how they their options for elderly care. And in many cases, they really just want the elderly to be at home because in Singapore's cultural context, it is also like that. Uh, you have to care for the elderly at home, otherwise you're not respecting them. At least that's the, that's the mainstream narrative, although it's beginning to to change and definitely the level of disability does affect the, the care that the whether the unpaid caregiver has to give or the domestic worker because it depends on whether the elderly is a bedridden case or whether they actually have the ability to be independent they just need someone to watch over them and so-called live with them to make sure someone is there in case minor accidents happen and I hear that among my informants, uh, although it's a few of them thus far, but the, the level of care that, that, that their elderly client needs is, it does vary. And I think it definitely does affect also the way they internalize their employment experience in terms of, is this a bad experience? Is this a bad elderly care experience? Because usually if the 
it's so dependent on the behavior of the the elderly person that they are that they are caring for and sometimes that can override the the level of care or the level of disability but i think this is quite a a question that i will think about in terms of um at least making my analysis more attentive towards the other dynamics that will influence uh influence our how we think about elderly care and work and also for elizabeth's question um yeah this is something that i believe quite strongly in or at least i uh hope that i can um so i do ask the fdw informants about if i could write something for you or okay not for you but if i could if I were to use our interview in my in my paper, um, is there anything you would like to express? Something along those lines. And many of them said, uh, you know, I think the Singapore government should really make home visits a thing. And some of them said, uh, you know, the construction workers, at least they have had uh, a lot of public attention. And I wish domestic workers have, have the same level of public outreach for us and that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of them actually said something along those lines and they say, oh, I want more community resources. I want to be able to have a community I can go out to when I need to vent. And um, I think um, at least if I can assist with maybe translating translating their, their interviews or translating their views uh, into my thesis and at least my friends and all that, they, they might read the the end product and that might kind of um, help a bit in terms of enriching the local awareness about the contrast between what many in Singapore think and uh, what the FVWs themselves think about this, this, this work. And in terms of the formal care, not all of them made that comparison, but some of them themselves mentioned that they want to change the visa type eventually. Uh, they want to move up into a nursing home and that kind of thing, but I didn't uh, include that in my interviews because I was afraid it would be quite a sensitive topic talking about the, the kind of visas and that kind of thing. So it was really kind of, um, I left it up to them for these first few interviews, but I think I would begin to maybe expand my topic list and be a bit more prompt, uh, like uh, taking a bit more initiative because uh, I'm really kind of using the their storytelling to kind of guide the conversation at this stage, but it stays within the, the topic of elderly care. So um, did the change, oh, do I just go on or? Sure, if you like, yeah, please go on. Yeah, um, yeah, did the change to online interviews rather than in-person limit the type of data and is there any worry about the empirical methodology? Yeah, uh, thanks Harrison. Definitely there is a, a change in that. I think the kind of data changes rather than a limitation, I would say it kind of um, perhaps exposed me to the fact that uh, social interaction is a much needed thing for many domestic workers nowadays because I feel that if I were to meet them on a usual Sunday, let's say without COVID, I wouldn't get this sense as strongly because um, a lot of them online, they were actually quite keen on. To my surprise, I expected it to be like a quick conversation in terms of they must be very busy. They're already entertaining me at home. And it turns out a lot of them, um, they actually describe their job as like quite boring as in like, oh, I'm just here with Ama the whole day. It's just me and her actually quite boring. So I spend a lot of time on my phone. So they actually really prolong the call for, not in a bad way, of course, but in a way that actually surprised me. And I kind of felt that, oh, is it, uh, maybe to me, this is so-called data collection, but I think for them, it's something else altogether. And uh, I think I may take that into the, methodological reflection because I do jot down quickly after that of you know what just happened in the video interview and I think if I were to meet people face to face uh, I would perhaps get the same kind of answers that I did but uh, there would be a different sense of internalizing this because I don't think I can judge as quickly in terms of the social interaction part what they are thinking or from the perspective of their of, of them talking to me. So thanks for that. And uh, for the... Lynn, I think we're uh, actually, because we're out of time, we're, we're going to um, just say that, you know, I'm afraid we can't get to all the remaining questions. Yeah, but for now, I think um, I want to thank everyone for, for these questions and thanks to Lynn for sharing her work and Anju for those really incisive 
comments. Um, I, I think Lynn will take these forward um, and find them extremely useful in the next couple of years. Um, I want to mention also that the recordings for all our past seminars are on our YouTube channel. Um, in, and um, so if you haven't been able to attend all the previous events, um, please, please do have a look. And if you have further questions or would like to continue conversing with Lynn, I'm sure that she would welcome uh, hearing from, from you. Um, so you can contact us directly. You can contact us first and we can connect you to Lynn if you, if you don't already have her contact. Okay, um, with that, I will, I will say thanks again to everybody. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Anju. Thank you, everyone who's um, attended this morning and hope to see you at our events again very soon.